<laughs> your suntan. Look at it. I thought it was a filter. <laughs> thought Terry's got his beauty filter on. Well, I haven't found that setting. <laughs> the, uh, the meeting is, is now live. My right arm tends to be a bit brown because it's out the window. <laughs> Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us on this. What day is it? Is it Wednesday or Thursday? I'm lost. Anyway, 9th of March. Welcome. Um, uh, so this is a virtual meeting of the Joint Staff Consultative Committee, and it's being conducted with members, officers and representatives at various locations, all communicating via audio and video and online. Uh, before the meeting starts, I'd like to invite the committee member and scrutiny officer, Louis Mata, to explain how proceedings will work and to confirm that members and officers are in attendance. Louis, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair. I'll just start with the members. Uh, do we have Councillor Terry Home? Present. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Claire Strong? Present. Thank you. And Councillor Keith Hoskins? Yes, good morning. Great, thank you. Uh, and now the officers. So do we have uh, Rebecca Webb? Good morning. Uh, thank you. Ian Cooper? Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Thank you. Maggie Williams? Good morning. Thank you very much. And do we also have um, Christina Kaur? Good morning. Thank you. And Debbie Eland? Good morning. Thank you very much. I think that's everyone. Um, so I'll just run through the proceedings. Uh, this meeting is being audio and video recorded and live streamed to the Council's YouTube channel. Members may request to speak using the raise hand function and the same function will be used to vote. Are there any questions before we start the meeting? No, back to you, Chair. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, okay, so we've had apologies from Dee Levitt. Are there any other apologies? Anyone would like to log? No, okay. Um, so we'll move on then to item number two, which is the minutes from the 15th of December, uh, 2021. Um, so I'd like to propose that we take as read and approve the true uh, record of the meetings of the committee that was having the 15th of December. Uh, are there any comments or questions before we kind of move to have a seconder for that? No, can I have a seconder for that then, please? Happy to do so, Chair. Thanks, Keith. Um, should we move straight to vote that? Oh, Terry, you've got your hand up. Sorry, it's a bit hard for me to see on the screen. Um, yeah, Terry, did you have uh, any comments? That's me voting. Oh, right, okay, great. <laughs> Get a hand up to vote then. Let's uh, let's all vote just to see if we can take those as read. I can't find my yellow hand, so we'll just use that one. Um, I think that one's passed, is it, Louis? <laughs> yeah, that's that's carried. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. All right, so this meeting meeting is being audio recorded as well as filmed. The audio recordings will be available to view on ModGov, and the film recording via the NHDC. NHDC YouTube channel. Members are reminded to make any declarations of interest before an item and the detailed reminder about this and speaking rights is set out under the chair's announcements on the agenda. So let's move on then to uh, item number four, which is the staff consultation forum, forum standard item. Um, and we've got minutes from December, January, February, and Ian, you're going to present those for us. Thank you, Chair. As ever, I'll just pick out a few of the, the key points, but happy to take questions on any, any of the contents. Um, so looking at the meeting back in December, uh, you'll see that uh, at that meeting, we announced that uh, we were extending the uh, right to request flexible working to day one of employment, uh, which was which means that you can request a change to uh, sort of your hours, uh, location and timing of your hours from the first day you're employed by us, which I think is a more flexible and actually more realistic compared to what we're already doing. Um, in that same meeting, we also confirmed to staff about annual leave carry forwards um, so you'll probably be aware that with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, there was a lot of more flexibility about the amount of leave that we carry forward uh, and in this in that meeting we set out how we transition back to normal quite a gradual transition uh, but a transition back to normal about the usual sort of five days straight one week carry forward um, but over quite a few years to get back to back to that normality 
Uh, and then a kind of recurring theme across all three of those December, January and February meetings uh, was the review of the staff consultation forum, uh, basically looking at the terms of reference and also, I suppose, a general refresh um, of, of the forum. Um, I mean, the meeting works, but we're just looking at how we can encourage engagement, both in terms of additional reps. And I'm glad to say that at the March meeting, we did have a new rep attending, which is great news, uh, but also that wider engagement between other members of staff and their reps. Um, so we kind of feel like we're getting to everyone. Um, and that, I suppose, has been partially exasperated by, by the pandemic and, and the, the increased move to sort of home-based working. Um, obviously, we're transitioning back away from that again, back into the office, but it does still make it more difficult for reps to kind of be the traditional kind of floor-based and kind of go around and see people. Um, so looking how we can improve that engagement, both through general communications through through the um, global emails and the notice board, but also the uh, SCF inbox to encourage people to use that. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the broad, the broad things that have been discussed over the last three months without going to anything that's going to duplicate what Rebecca will tell you in a minute about the HR update or going into the sort of really detailed stuff. Um, and yeah, happy to take the questions and the content. Lovely, thanks so much, Ian. Um, before I just throw it out to everybody, I'm going to jump in and just uh, ask a very quick question. I was really interested by the employee queries around the use of the offices and whether or not they may go to residential. Was there anything behind that that you that you understood, or was that just a kind of a query that came out of of, of left field, as it were? There is nothing we have said that would imply we're going to use residential. Yeah, if we did, if we did let the third floor, which is the one we are keeping, kind of sort of semi out of use, it's very unlikely residential. Um, it would be much more likely to be kind of office based usage, given it's got um, office space all around it. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it was just just sort of people someone reflecting on the fact that there's a lot of conversion of uh, office space to residential, but that's generally I think sort of whole blocks rather than individual floors. Thank you. Struck me as an unusual question. Uh, Claire, you put your hand up. Yes, thank you. I have a question on page 14, and this was the questions that were being asked about elections. And it says in there, will the 2023 elections go ahead? Or will they defer to 2024? And it says there that the 2023 elections are going to be deferred to 2024. And that was the first I actually knew about that. Let me check that. That might be wrong. It might have been a comment that was made incorrectly. Because I think we still have a 2023 election, uh, thinking about it. Um, so, yeah, I, I will get that corrected. But, yes, my, my, my understanding is that, yes, there's an election 2023. There is an election. So, please, please get, get that information back, because we don't want all those counters and tellers to think that they've got a year off, please. Because <laughs> I know how hard it is sometimes to get all the, uh, you know, the, a lot, particularly staff members, but make sure they're not all suddenly booking their holidays and then we're not going to be able to do the uh, the election. Thank Great you. Great spot. Thank you, Claire. Um, any other questions or comments on these minutes? Okay, I can't see any more hands. So our recommendation is just to note those minutes then and, and I propose that we do. I'm not seeing any, any uh, other uh, comments on those. So moving forward then, we can go now to item five and we've got Rebecca to present the HR update, the quarterly HR update. Rebecca. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay, so I'm going to highlight some key points of interest for the committee members. Um, firstly, Moving to 3.2, the people recovery plan, um, and Ian has covered this already, but since restrictions have lifted and employees are allowed to um, return to the office, we are seeing a gradual return. Um, and that continues to be facilitated by the online desk booking system, um, laptops, video conferencing in meeting rooms. Um, and there are several measures still in place for now, including face masks, distancing, um, and desk cleaning. Um, 3.3 discusses recruitment um, and the higher turnover that we're seeing is reflected in an increased recruitment activity. Um, in general, we have seen really good interest levels in vacancies and we are able to successfully fill posts, but there were two um, posts during this period 
that had um, low interest, so needed to be re-advertised. And, and I think that's really reflective of the labour market at the moment. Um, professional roles such as legal and planning um, have always been fairly hard to fill and they're still proving to be hard to fill um, and the HR team work closely with managers in those areas to develop resolutions um, on a case-by-case -case basis. 3.5 um, apprentices, we're in the process of recruiting three further apprentice posts um, and we are seeing the levy become more established and that's allowing us um, to select more specialist learning, which is really positive because it better supports the variety of teams and services we have at the council. And training providers are continuing to offer a mix of remote learning and face-to-face -face observations. Um, section 3.6 covers the pay award and is outdated. Um, we have now had an agreement on the 2021 pay award um, and that's been processed for the March pay. Um, the 2022 um, pay bargaining isn't expected to begin until next month. And so there will be another delay, another wait for employees until we, we know what the 2022 pay award will look like. Um, moving on to section 3.7, which um, covers employee benefits. Um, and Ian talked earlier about how the council have opened up flexible working requests to day one of employment. Um, so the only thing really to add there is the benefits for flexible working. Um, this is a really positive move for our employees and us as an employer, um, because there are huge benefits to flexible working, including um, improved well-being, better work balance, work-life balance, and increased productivity. Um, Shaping our future in 3.10, um, organisational values have been further developed to be more concise and they have been agreed as together, listening, learning, adaptable and inclusive. Um, the communication on these values will be ongoing and supported by graphics and a logo once that's finalised. Um, and an action plan has been developed based on the outcomes of the Shaping Our Future steering group discussions. Um, 3.11, um, and Maggie will speak later um, in more detail around equalities, but um, the inclusion group took place um, in December, talking about sex, sexual orientation and transgender. Um, the overall feel was that the council is an inclusive place to work um, and could maybe be more vocal about celebrating that success. The group fully support the council's values and the plans to publicise them as part of our recruitment web pages to help attract potential candidates. Um, it was noted during the discussions that there are now more female service directors at the council um, and the group were interested in hearing about the experiences of these women. So it has been agreed for a female service director to attend the group and share some of her experiences. Uh, 3.12, um, the absence data is shown in the report. Um, you'll note that the COVID absence has increased again. And again, that's somewhat expected um, due to the cases in the district. And overall short-term absence levels continue to increase. Um, some of this is based around the COVID numbers, but also others around minor infections. Um, and we feel this is likely to be due to the lifting of restrictions and that increased kind of socialising, which is allowing for um, minor bugs and infections to better circulate. Um, and finally, as I mentioned in the recruitment section, um, labour turnover continues to be high and we'll see, we're, we're seeing that with a number of um, jobs that we have being advertised at the moment. It has started to slow in the last three months, um, but we are expecting these higher levels to continue for some time yet. Um, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. That's brilliant. Um, I've got a couple of hands up. So Debbie, your hand is up. 
Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to um, ask um, a question and make a comment, if that was okay. Um, the the question um, was about um, at the moment you you still having to sort of kind of book desks to come into the office, and I'm wondering whether the plan is to sort of kind of continue with that or whether it will just sort of kind of revert to how it was pre-pandemic when you just turned up basically. Um, so that that was the question. I don't know if you want to do that first or shall I just yes. say the comment? <laughs> Carry on, Debbie, if you've got yeah, a comment. Okay. Let's have well, that too. The comment was just about flexible working and just to say that um, obviously as a member of staff, um, I think North Hearts Council has been, at, you know, way ahead of, of certainly neighbouring authorities in flexible working. Um, and, you know, and also I think the support that we've had through the pandemic, staff have had and, and through the pandemic has been second to none from our employer. And I would just, you know, on behalf of lots of staff, I would just like to to thank the employer for that because um, it really has been appreciated, the extra leave and stuff that we got at Christmas and stuff like that. And as I say, they're ahead of the game and always have been in, in terms of flexible working. I'll, I'll be quiet now. Thank you. That's brilliant, Debbie. Thank you so much for saying that. And, and I'll, uh, can we just make sure that is specifically noted? I know sometimes the notes, it says comments were made, but if we could just make sure that we specifically note those comments, I think that's a really important one. Um, who wanted to come back in? You've got your hand up. Did you want to come back on this desk booking question? Yeah, I'll take that question. Um, we're going to see how it goes. Um, so the plan in terms of transition back to normal will be that we will release all the desks into the desk booking system at some point uh, when we feel it's kind of safe to do so. And then we'll see how it goes. If there's always capacity uh, around people wanting desks, then we might stop paying for the desk booking system. Uh, if we find out that there's always kind of a, a manageable level of demand, but it does need sort of some, some organising for a desk booking system, we'll keep it. Um, so it's just a case of wait and see, I think, on that one. Sounds eminently sensible. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or questions? I have a few. So. Um... I'm going to go with mine, see if any hands go up while I'm talking. Uh, first of all, I just want to say well done for maintaining your, the apprentices. I think it's been a particularly difficult time for young people to be in work. And um, and I know that um, throughout the pandemic, the because apprenticeships are generally for younger people we've seen a lot of the labour market is in a lot of apprenticeships um ended prematurely simply because of working arrangements so I just want to say huge well done on that and also I wanted to just note that the um candidate levels for for roles pre-pandemic were were tricky and there was I know that we came to this meeting and we talked um, and those of us that have been here ages when we remember the conversations that we've had around how do we we increase attraction for some of those roles so again it's just another kind of pat on the back really to say that the, the, the market's got harder a lot harder for attraction so huge well done on that as well um I did want to ask a question around the pay award, um, particularly the, the inevitable delay now with, with the uh, 2022 pay award. Obviously, cost of living is a very big concern for everybody, and I'm sure that for NHGC colleagues, um, it, it's the same. Is there, what are we able to do to, uh, if anything, to to speed up that time that we can get money in pockets where it, where it counts? Um, so we actioned this pay award very quickly. I've heard that there have been other councils that have not um, been able to action it as quickly as we did. So I'm really pleased that we we heard about it, had a couple of days and got it into this month's salary. Um, so timing was was good for us there. Um, the, the pay negotiations are really in the hands of the national employers. We attend the regional briefings um, and we'll continue to do that. Um, there's one coming up in a couple of weeks and I will be going to that one. Um, I think that the thing that we can focus on as a council is um, the other reasons, I appreciate that pay is very important to people, um, but the other reasons for 
um, North Hearts being a good a good place to work um, and looking at things like benefits and values and and the flexible working piece. Um, and I think that's where the focus will be. And we're looking at reviewing our benefits um, later in this year just to make sure that they are um, where they should be doing what they should be and providing what is um, what is asked for by our employees but with regard to the the actual pay award um, we need to wait for unions to come forward with with what they're going to request first thank you um, I wonder if I might be able to float an idea that Ian will hate um, <laughs> of the uh, I think it's a particular concern this year around getting getting money in pockets and I think if we have a minimum that we know uh, the, the pay award is likely to be and there will be an element of backdating. I wonder if it's if it's worth just throwing into the, the mix the, uh, an option of being able to set a minimum level of, of pay award so that we can pay that on time and then readjust if negotiations um, uh, prove to be a, a higher level. I, I don't expect an answer now. I just wanted to throw that in sort of officially as, a, as a, an option to, to consider. Um, and I know that Ian sat thinking, no, um, it's, it's a lot and it's, big and it's a risk, but I think there are a number of other risks as well this year for people. And so, yeah, I just wanted to throw that one out there in the mix. I don't know if anybody had any thoughts on that. Um, the only other thing that I want to say um, about the HR update is the values bit. So I loved the values um, as they were because they translated into behaviours really well. I thought that was so clever um, and I saw them being used and I wondered whether the, the new iteration bless you the, whether the new iteration would also do the same or uh, whether there was a, a whether other people felt as much passion for them as I did <laughs> so the question is will they will they also translate into behaviors and and sort of that practical this is what this means yes when um when we get the graphics ready um there will be the single words are there to be sure that they are easily remembered by people. Um, and that I think will really help with embedding them across the council. Um, but there will be some description that comes along with that, um, that will be part of the communication. Um, and that's already in the RPR documentation. So it's already forming part of the conversation. So yes, there will be a, an easy translation to behaviours. Brilliant, thank you. Claire, your hands for that. Yeah, I, I have to say the bit I was I like interest. I like facts and figures, and that was on the absences, uh, particularly around uh, the COVID absences, which actually I found fascinating because it actually to me actually um, reinforced you know what we were seeing the national figures. And, but what was slightly uh, surprising to me was the number of cases and the days off in twenty twenty one was averaged about four days, um, whereas in twenty two twenty uh, twenty one twenty two it was about five days off which I actually would have thought it was the other way around because obviously the later one, we all were, vac we all were vaccinated and being told that, you know, that the disease wasn't, you know, if you got it, the virus, it wasn't so um, it, perhaps intrusive, uh, you know, and you recovered quickly on that. So that bit I, quite, I found quite fascinating. But the other thing that's not mentioned, it talks about number of employees, long-term sick. Do we know if we have um, members of staff who, as a result of having COVID, have now got long COVID and are also needing to have, uh, you know, some you know, you know, people I know that have got have had are having long COVID. They say that they're all right for a few hours, and then they go into a complete and utter sort of wave of tiredness, and they just have to sort of stop what they're doing and just have a rest or whatever, and then they can carry on again. But it's that tiredness factor. I just wondered if we had staff that that were in that situation and how we were coping with that. Yes, we have had some cases of that. Um, some last for a, a reasonably short period, so a number of weeks after the initial infection, and, and others, not very many, but have lasted longer. Um, so the business partners within the team are supporting managers um, to make sure that we're, we're, we're providing what's needed to support those employees. That's very reassuring, thank you. I'm sure, I'm sure it would be, but I just thought I'd ask. Excellent. Okay, I can see no other hands up. Um, 
I think it's an interesting point on the number of days lost due to COVID. There could be any number of reasons for that, I'm sure. Um, uh, and uh, perhaps that, that might be worth looking at if the, if the trend continues to go up. Um, but I think, yeah, it's a, it's an, a good one to note for now. Right, but no other hands up then. Our recommendation is to note that report. I do have to say, apologies that I keep turning this way. I've got papers on all three screens, so I, that's why you keep seeing inside of my head. Apologies for that. Um, so we'll note that report then and move on to item six, which is the equalities update. And Maggie, you're going to present this for us. Thank you, Chair. And um, yeah, the uh, the report, as you see, is in, in three parts, and I just wanted to pull out uh, some of the, some of the key points. I am aware that there are a lot of a lot of facts and figures included in that, and we we've tried to make it uh, easier to to read and, and see by uh, putting some uh, uh, graphics or charts in Appendix 1, which gives the figures uh, in a visual form. And also for those that like the stats, uh, the sort of past year's performance is given in Appendix uh, 2 there. So um, the, uh, the first chunk of the report is around the equalities data, which we uh, publish for the previous year each January and so the figures we're looking at for this are 2021's figures and I just wanted to pull out a few uh, key points. Uh, uh, overall the figures are very stable over the past few years there's been very few changes but just to to go through the protected characteristics and, and pull out a few points of interest um, on age we're all we're all getting older, and this is uh, this is being shown um, in the profile for the council now. In that, our largest group of employees of uh, twenty seven percent of the staff are now uh, in the fifty five to sixty four age group. Um, up to now, the most popular age group for the council was forty five to fifty four. So. Uh, a whole tranche of people have had birthdays and got older um, and moved up a tranche um, last year. So um, it means that we have now got 56% of our council are aged over 45. So that's a point that's uh, worth bearing in mind when we're looking to the future and planning that um, that, that is the case. Um, in, uh, in moving to appointments, there's been a, a notable increase in those in the 35 to 44 age group um, and the 45 to 54. So that, uh, that, that 20 years seems to have become more popular for, for recruitment in the last year. Um, but we have had a decrease in the appointments from the age 26 to to 34 age group. So it, it would seem that that was reflecting the sort of vacancies we have um, in the professional and technical area where uh, that, those middle 20 years of employment uh, seem to be where uh, most recruits are coming from. Um, on the levers, I think uh, the key point is to note that we've had a very sharp increase of 21% in those under the age of 25, leaving the council, um, and a third of all levers are in this age group. Um, and um, I think uh, we, uh, Rebecca was talking about uh, turnover and recruitment. I think this reflects that um, those, um, those individuals in that age group, they tend to be moving on from their first job or perhaps their second job. So I think turnover is likely to be higher uh, in that age group, but it does obviously have implications for trying to recruit younger staff if the turnover is higher in that group. Moving on to disability, we've had no change in the number of staff declaring a disability since last year, so that's sitting at 5%, but we have had a sharp increase in those not declaring uh, their disability status um, in the last year. And I think that the key point to pull out on, on disability is around uh, recruitment again. Uh, we have 1% of appointments um, in the last year that were um, made from the group declaring a disability. 
Um, but we, we've been starting some work to look at why the ratios of applications to appointments and shortlisted candidates to appointments are very much lower in the group with a disability than they are those without a disability. So um, there is a project looking at recruitment and one of the aspects will be, are we doing as much as we possibly can to make sure firstly we attract individuals from that group and that we make uh, every effort to ensure that as they go through the process, if there is any actions we need to take to support individuals, um, then th those are those are made to uh, increase this, if you like, the success rate for the individuals from that group. And again, looking at ethnic origin, uh, we've had no change in the makeup of the staff. It's uh, still sitting at 6% from a non-white background. And last year, we um, had 20% uh, of our appointments from that group. This year, it's dropped a little bit by uh, 2%. But looking back over the last five years, the average was 7% uh, from that group. So the fact that in 2021, 18% of our recruits came from that group shows that, uh, that we've, uh, we've made, uh, made progress to increase the numbers of uh, recruits from there. And we also had a decrease in the number of leavers from the non-white background in 2021. Um, the figures on gender um, uh, are, are very stable as are everything else. We are still a, around two thirds, one third female to, to male, but there was a significant reduction uh, in the number of female appointments to the council last year. And it's the lowest figure uh, that we've had since 2017 uh, there. And um, on the marital status, we have had an increase in the numbers that are deciding they don't want to declare that status on their um, on their applications or indeed um, on their employee data. With religion, the Christian uh, staff numbers are reducing and it's now at the lowest level for seven years, but we have had quite a significant increase in those from other religions joining the council in the last year. Uh, sexual orientation, uh, over the last seven years, the figures have barely changed regarding that. And we have about uh, or around 1% of the staff from non-heterosexual groups. And again, a, a bit of a theme developing. There was a sharp increase in the numbers who preferred not to state their sexual orientation uh, in the last year. Moving on to the other parts of the report, which look at um, the policies and procedures we have, and also our split between full-time and part-time staff. We had no change in the um, split between full-time and part-time staff in 2021. Uh, so still we have 63% of uh, staff work full-time and obviously 37 part-time. And, um, it, following three years of growth last year, we had a drop in the numbers, uh, oh, sorry, the percentages of females working full time by 3%. But that last year, it increased again by 1%. So it's still below uh, where it was 2019, but um, has recovered a little from last year. Um, in terms of long-term sick, the numbers of cases have remained very stable over the last few years. Um, and again, I think last year we, we pointed out that 91% of the uh, cases, long-term sick cases, were female staff, um, which was uh, a cause for concern. This has dropped last year to 84%, but obviously still disproportionately high when you look at the split. Um, across the council um, of, uh, of male and female. And as to be expected, the older you get, the more likely you are to end up, uh, unfortunately, with a long-term health condition. So um, our long-term sick cases, 72% of them were over four, in the over 45 age groups and only 4% 4, 4 in those under 25. 
And um, just to, to look at the attendance procedure, it's very significant that um, last year, so 20, between 2019 and 2020, we had a very steep drop, 62% in the number of cases going under the attendance procedure. And, and that dropped again in 2021. We had just one case under the attendance procedure last year. And I think that very much reflects the conditions of the pandemic and the working from home. And I think it's gonna be very interesting to see as we move to blended working, whether uh, the cases of attendance procedure uh, increase again or remain at the very low level because things like flexible working enable people to still uh, work when they have maybe a minor illness or an, an infection that they didn't want to spread around. Um, and, and so they've been able to work from home and not, uh, and not come in. But um, in the past, they would have been coming in and uh, spreading their spreading their germs around uh, there. But um, it, it would be interesting to see how that attendance uh, procedure um, moves forward. And just a couple more points on, on the levers. Um, again, picking up on uh, the recruitment that was mentioned in the previous report, um, we have had the highest number of levers in 2021 uh, uh, since 2015. And there was a 50% increase uh, since 2020. And I think that is probably so steep because during 2020 under the pandemic, everybody uh, felt that they were going to sit tight um, and, uh, and the opportunities uh, or the uncertainties of moving to another job were, were too, too great for people to contemplate. But as we moved through last year, people began to see the, uh, the opportunities elsewhere. So 70% uh, of all our leavers um, have uh, left us uh, due to resignations um, rather than any other reason. And my final point on the equalities, and I've, I've mentioned it a couple of times, is uh, the uh, increase in the number of individuals who are not submitting data across the range of characteristics, and especially um, especially worthy of note is that uh, disability and sexual orientation, 30% of staff we have no information on, and with religion it is 28%. And given how important it is for a full picture of our equalities profile um, to drive our diversity and inclusion agenda in an informed way, um, we will be working to um, ensure that staff understand why we're asking for this information and to build their trust as to how it will be used and where it will be used and how it will be confidentially kept. And we will be um, using various methods such as uh, touching base with the inclusion group and staff briefings and the insight um, articles to promote this uh, because I think it's really important that we get as full a picture of the, the profile of the council as possible. And also another step we've taken is uh, individuals give their um, equalities data during the recruitment process. And we've now been able to transfer that data across into our HR system uh, for the individuals that join us, because one of the things that was being uh, noted in the figures was that it was individuals with short service who tended not to have completed their equalities data. So if we can make it an automatic process that the information they give at recruitment flows into our system, then we're going to get a better picture uh, for our staff. And... Um, I thought if I, I pause there, I, I don't know if there's any questions on the equalities data before I move on to having a quick look at the equal pay review. No. Okay, yeah, good opportunity for pause. Are there any hands up? Can't see any hands. I, I think, um, oh, Claire, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I've always got questions. So I have to say, there is just so much data here and I, I do find a lot of it, you know, fascinating, fascinating, particularly when one's looking at trending and changing 
over the years of how um, you know, employees in the council and that are changing. Uh, I thought the, the age profile with everybody getting older, I think we could say the same with all the councillors, actually. If you look at that. We're probably um, going, that, going in that direction. Um, and it probably does, but for me, it always, to me, it means that, that you know, that, that section that have got into those older brackets does mean that they're more likely to stay with the council till retirement because they don't, they're not going to look for change. So that sometimes that is actually perhaps good, not bad, that we've got an age. The only problem is making sure that we've got the succession planning in, 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 um, in place so that when they all do decide to retire, that we can, we have um, people that can fill the roles that they've been doing. Um, yeah, I'm, and I'm going to go back because I'm, I'm always fascinated um, long-term sickness because when an employee is often out of um, a job it's and they're not doing, you know, they're not in work. And I know we have lots of um, programmes to help employees coming back. But I have to say, I'm, I'm, it's, to me, a lot of long-term sickness, is, it's the cause of why people are taking. And if it's um, related to, you know, like surgery and that, that's often going to mean that if, if an employer has had a, a procedure and they've been hospitalised, it's very likely that they're going to have a long term, you know, a period of recovery before they're coming back. And then it's that getting back into work and having a programme where they don't have to come back, you know, sort of bang straight into a full time employment. Do we look at any of that sort of data and break it down on terms of the long term sickness? Rebecca, maybe. So I'm not sure if you would be better able to talk about that with the work that the business uh, partners do. Can I just clarify the question? I think, Claire, what you're asking is, do, do, do these people on long-term sick, do they all have access to a sort of flexible return to work? Is, is that what you're asking? That, that, that's part of it, but also knowing what, the, you know, looking at what the causes of the long-term sickness okay. are. I guess I'm trying to look work out whether or not it's like medical procedures where people have been in, you know, hospitalised and then that all often, you know, for some, I mean, I know in my own case, you know, I had a period I was written off for about six weeks but actually I needed longer than that before I returned to work. Uh, and then I came back on a gradual basis and it, it just because you're, one is not fit enough to return to work. So that is one kind of long-term sickness, but, the, and, and that, but then there's also... Um, sort of long term thickness that is a result of things like stress. Rebecca. Yes, so we, the, the data itself or the cases it's, uh, themselves are talked about um, as part of um, a business partner team meeting and they will take that opportunity to look for any patterns that might be concerning. Um, my understanding is that we've got um, a whole mix of, of reasons why we're seeing um, long-term sick. We don't have a huge number of cases, but the, the reasons are mixed. And we, we don't, at this point, we're not seeing a pattern of um, mental health issues, although I'm not saying they're not there, but we don't, we're not seeing that pattern um, to be concerned about. Occupational health are always involved in giving in giving advice to HR and managers on all of these cases um, around um, what other support can be offered as well as flexible return to works and um, staff are always always reminded about their EAP and the support that they can get from their line manager as well as HR um, but yes so the, so the data is is looked at and we are looking for patterns that may cause concern um, but there can be a variety of different reasons as you say we've had we've had cases of um, cancer we've had um, mental health cases we've had cases due to things like uh, broken legs and, and that kind of thing um, so there's a huge variety that we we deal with with long-term sick thanks Rebecca and uh, I'm making a presumption that there are that the flexible return to work is available for everyone Yes. So I think I think what I'm hearing is that on a, a with sort of twenty on a sample size of twenty five, a, cu a couple of unfortunate skiing trips could change the the trend quite considerably um, into what the causes were. Uh, okay, thank you for that. Um, are there any other questions before we move on to pay? I do have a couple. Uh, so while I'm waiting to see if hands go up, I could just sort of float those. I guess the big question is, this is such a rich source of data. There's so much here. What do we do with it? 
Where does it go? Exactly. Um, the, the equalities data are published on our uh, website, as we have to do under the transparency regulations. We also look at it within HR to pull out any themes, any actions that we want uh, to progress uh, uh, and feel are important. And, and I think the question of what else do we do with the, with the data is something that we have uh, been talking about within HR, because as you say, the, there's such a lot in here that we, we could use and how can we better use it? Um, so I think that is an ongoing consideration for us. Um, with so, uh, Sorry. So just to come in on that, I think it was interesting to hear you talk about the reduction of female appointments to the council. And for me, it, that feels as though there's a reason for that. COVID very negatively hit females, particularly uh, uh, parents. Um, and, and it was it, the, 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 there's there's reasons behind which you could reasonably explain. But there are other things that I think, actually, I don't understand the reason behind that. And that might be something that that we would need to really focus on. And the big one for me was the disability piece. So um, there's the whole piece around people not disclosing, which you've obviously examined. But then there is also the fact that it is still quite low. And and I think that could be quite a useful Kind of feed into the the strategy moving forward of what what is the council doing to support those with disabilities not just to work um, and it may be a physical disability and there's obviously accessibility there but then there is also this that the, the uh, sort of neurodiversity for example is also classed as disability and what therefore are we doing to assist those but also how are we encouraging disclosure of that in order to be able to assist in a really productive way and I think those are the things that, are, that, that you don't know the reasons, we can't know the reasons behind them because actually the next step is let's examine that a bit more closely. Is that work happening or is that something that you're planning? Or yes, we're, we're, definitely, we're definitely planning that. Um, Rebecca mentioned the recruitment project that's mm-hmm. underway. That, that's one aspect, but there are other aspects as well. And I think it's also giving information uh, to staff about what, what does a uh, declaring a disability mean in the council and and also getting across what we're looking at there it, it, because people can um, declare a disability um, because of a long-term health condition but actually that may improve over time and they will no longer believe that they uh, have a disability and, and will take up so I think it's it's promoting an understanding of what we're talking about around what is a disability, why sh- why should you declare it, um, and the fact that it's not a, a once and forever declaration that you can never move back from, and, and I don't think we've quite got that understanding across uh, the, yes. the council at the moment. And I also know with disability, the uh, the inclusion group we're focusing on that, and had a very interesting discussion on what it was like to be in the council um, if you had a disability and and the support given. So I think that it's a lot of communication around that. And and that's that's true, not just for the disability part, but for the the other protected characteristics to to gain a level of trust, I think, about um, about what we're looking for and, and why we're looking for it. Love that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think positive role models as well and just making sure that we've got enough of those sourced. I wonder whether that's done. Um, my only other question, my last question on this, and it might not be a question, it might be a really horrible comment that I just throw in and walk away from, but um, I don't understand why we care about marital status. No, I, I think, it, I think it's, um, it's becoming obvious that n- nobody really cares about it and it, it, it's a non-issue, but it is one of the nine protected characteristics that we are uh, obliged to declare data on if we if we have it. Um, and I think that's about as much as I can say on, on it. Um, it you know, the, the, the transparency regulation says, that, you know, if you have the data, you have to state it, but I, I can't see the relevance of that um, going forward. I, I kind of query why why it is a protected characteristic, but it is, and and I suppose we have to work with it until until the law changes. Excellent, thank you. Just move on to the pay. Oh, Debbie, you have a your hand up. Sorry, I didn't see that. 
It's okay. I just wanted to sort of kind of um, touch on the, the marriage thing that I know that the inclusion group, that is the topic of discussion for their next meeting in June. So perhaps that, that might be something to, to raise there. I, I don't know if we'll come up with any answers, but um, that is the next topic for the group. So It's only relevant on a dating profile, surely. <laughs> You can quote me on that. Um, OK, let's move on to pay. <laughs> OK, so so um, we have done a number of equal pay reviews over the, uh, over the years since 2004 and our, our single status um, position at that point. And uh, again, again, very stable uh, in the latest review. We, we did it slightly differently in that we started a traffic light system to sort of uh, flag up. Um, the different, and I think that's been very helpful helpful at kind of clarifying where potential issues have arised and focusing in our efforts on um, what needs further investigation to, to understand why we've got the figures that we've got. And we took the view that we would look at the, uh, the red flags, so that's a gap of more than 5%, either positive or negative. Um, and also in the amber category where we were moving towards the red was also worth another look. And um, I think what's pull, pulling out of this um, is that our hay grading system is very robust and it, it does a very good job at ensuring equal pay across the council. And uh, we, we have actually um, in, got to the position where looking at the, the various um, uh, sets of data that we have, that we have no unexplained basic pay inequalities. When we dig into the figures that were flagged up, uh, length of service um, is an explanation in many of them. And that links back to our grading system where we have an incremental grading system. Length of service um, does mean that people are paid more <laughs> within the grade. So, um, if you like new joiners will will always always look um look like they're not being paid the same so uh, as i say that's something that we uh, that we looked at and, and um as i say we came to the conclusion there was uh, there weren't any unexplained uh inequalities uh and again we we hit the same issue in doing the analysis on equal pay of the lack of data uh, in certain groups um, because, of course, we're using the same equalities data for the equal pay review as we use for um, our equalities figures. So if there are gaps in it, we can't do all the pay comparisons that we would perhaps like to. Um, is there anyone, yeah. any comments on the, on the equal pay review? Well, I'm waiting to see if any hands go up. Um, and obviously, please do put your hand up if you have any questions or comments. Um, I'd like to just just check in on kind of with this equal pay, particularly on the gender. I know that there was some work that was going on around kind of how to increase opportunities for women at senior levels and how to how to open up some of those potential barriers. Is that work continuing? And can I just ask who is leading it? Again, maybe Rebecca, can you, I, I believe the work is continuing. Rebecca, can you give us an update? Um, I think that there was a change to the gender pay gap group, which I think is what you're referring to in yeah. 2021. Um, perhaps it was late 2020. Um, and so this has developed into a broader group, which is the in inclusion group. Um, so that that means that those actions from the gender pay gap group are now on the action tracker for the inclusion group. Um, and so they will they're taking a different focus um, at each meeting, which means that gender isn't that we're not always talking about um, about sex We're 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 talking about different subjects as well. Um, so. Yes, it's covered in that action tracker to answer, answer your question. Lovely, thank you. Are there any other questions, queries or comments? There are not. 
Maggie, you've obviously covered that off so well in your presentation. Thank you. Well done. Um, and thank you. Thank you for coming along and bringing along such sorry. a lot of information. So can on. I just move on to the, the third part, the gender pay gap? Oh, OK. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, I, I, I actually wanted to give an update on the information in the report, which uh, was showing the figures that were published last year for 2020. We now have the figures for 2021, which will be published uh, in a couple of weeks. And uh, the, uh, the good news is that um, we have an improvement in our um, mean and median gender pay gaps. Um, so it's uh, they, they've narrowed again in 2021, which has brought them to their lowest level since we started to report in 2017. So um, we now have a, a gap that... Um, sorry. I've written it on a different bit of paper there. Sorry. So our uh, our mean hourly rate um, gap is now seventeen point five percent, which is down from twenty percent last year, and our median rate is now twelve point eight percent, which is down from thirteen percent last year. So that's that's good news, and in terms of the uh, quartiles that whilst the proportion of females in the upper quartile is still lower than in the other quartiles, it's up nearly seven and a half percent since 2019. Um, so now at 49.4% uh, female in the upper quartile, we're nearly at an even split uh, in that top quartile. So um, as I say, Having said that, um, the, the mean figures uh, that we've got for 2021 show females at the council earn £123.21 a week compared, um, sorry, less, sorry, £123.21 less than their male counterparts per week or £6,406.92 less than their male uh, colleagues per year so that is still a significant gap but it, I think it does show that the efforts we've put in place are bearing fruit and we are reducing that gap year on year which is the intention of having these figures and publishing them is to show the direction of travel rather than the absolute figures themselves. Mm. Lovely. Thank you, Maggie. Apologies. I thought you'd I thought you'd covered off what you wanted to do with the previous bit. Um, but it was good to have that particular focus on the gender pay gap. Um, so thank you for that. And great hot off the press news there on improvement. Um, I think it's clear that the um the that moving to a 50-50 split or, or and as near as you as we can in the upper quartile is great but it's really showing that those that those middle quartiles is where the gap is sitting and where that 70 percent is coming from and i think that's that's a, an interesting conversation to be having around when you're when you're kind of you know moving forward with the brilliant recruitment stuff that you've been doing and again i must i must just point out the 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 relationship there between the difficulty you've had in in hiring females throughout the covid pandemic and the difficulty you've had in female appointments and yet you're still closing that gap in the upper quartile to reach a 50 50 split that's really really impressive work um, so just to note a uh, well done on that are there any hands up on the, to talk on the gender pay gap at all I think there is all round confidence that that work is is uh, has been done really well and that the, the the next steps are all in play. So well done, everyone. And thank you, Maggie, for pre presenting such a thorough and rich set of data. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, our recommendations are simply to note that report, which I think we've all done. Uh, so shall we move straight through then on to the discussion paper on the employer's role in keeping staff healthy? And Rebecca, you're going to present this one for us. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, yes, the employer's role in keeping staff healthy and it was requesting a focus on mental health with the backdrop of the pandemic being considered. Um, so um, North Hearts has always been conscious of its responsibility to support the well-being of its employees. Um, and this is set out in health and safety law. 
Um, the council has gone beyond this general requirement and since the pandemic, the council has responded to the emerging well-being and mental health challenges with a wide range of additional direct support and helpful resources. We recognise that it's not just about our duty of care and the legal and moral obligations to employees. It also reflects that the right support contributes to creating an effective and efficient organisation. Placing importance on employee well-being helps us create greater loyalty with our staff, contributes to better recruitment and retention, and better staff engagement and productivity. The focus on well-being is in keeping with our values. In particular, we work together to support each other to deliver the best we can. Um, Prior to the pandemic, North Hearts has taken a proactive approach to supporting the well-being of staff, and this has included a number of things, um, such as annual flu vaccination vouchers, um, the employee assistance program, and training to support well-being, etc. Um, at the start of the pandemic and the first lockdown, it was recognised that there was potential for the new ways of working and in addition to the global health crisis to create anxiety and mental health issues. The organisation has played an important role in supporting our people through this difficult period and beyond. The initial response was to ensure that within the first couple of months of lockdown, everybody received a welfare call from HR to check in with them and ask about their well-being. For many employees, this checking call provided reassurance and some contact from outside of their own team. These calls also helped to identify specific issues as well as offering or directing individuals to more support that may have been required. HR also created a lockdown toolkit, which is on our intranet page, of resources and guidance that staff could tap into to support their own health and well-being and that of their family. Following on from these checking calls, there have been several further check-in emails sent individually to, to employees signposting new resources, reminding um, of existing resources and encouraging staff to get in touch if they needed further support. Other well-being <clears throat> resources and support that have been introduced include a GP helpline, um, training of mental health first aiders, coronavirus support page, consultation with staff regarding returning to the office and moving to a blended or hybrid approach, workshops um, covering well-being and productivity, um, arranging a virtual kitchen get together for staff to have that informal um, communication with each other. Um, we've also been able to offer unlimited access to a range of health and wellbeing classes through the employee assistance provider. And in mid-January, we launched the Headspace Wellbeing app, which has been really well received with um, 78 employees signing up during the first month alone. Whilst the rationale for keeping staff healthy is clear, there is also a balance to be struck. North Hearts remains the employer and as such the relationship with staff is contractual based on consideration by both parties so acceptable performance for uh, payment for that work. Ultimately North Hearts are not the primary health care provider, social care or responsible for issues in an employee's life. The responsibility to fulfil the contract and look after their health lies with the individual. However, for the reasons um, set out above, we can and should provide support, flexibility, practical tools, signposts to the appropriate support and agencies, and if nothing else, a listening ear. There is a need to ensure that we do not give employees the impression that we're there to solve their problems or pile pressure on managers to resolve every wellbeing issue. The organisation can provide some direct support, but ultimately acts as a conduit to support to the support available. And I welcome any questions or thoughts on that. Thank you, Rebecca. That was really thoughtful and an excellent written paper. Thanks for all the prep in that. Keith, you have your hand up. 
Yeah, thanks, um, Kate. I, I just wanted to say I read this and thought what a really good paper it was and could provide a template for so many others. And I think it just goes to underpin what Debbie was saying earlier about the support that's been received over and above and beyond um, what, what may reasonably be expected. So I just wanted to say I thought it was really good. Yeah, thank you. Um, anyone else want to add any comments, any questions on that? If I could just add, if you don't mind, Chair, um, in, in response to Councillor Hoskins there, um, as always, the pulling together of the papers here is a joint effort. It's the whole of the HR team. And in this case, Joe and Keith worked on that paper. So um, I had the easy job of, of reading it out to you today, but they, okay. they did the hard work. Thank you. Uh, Claire? Yeah, I was going to say, I thought it was a very, a very good paper. I enjoyed reading it. And I think probably that, again, when we know what the, you know, the conditions are that we, we have and we offer to our employees, that's why when we do staff survey, we get results from that as well, indicating that it's a nice, good place to work. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to just comment a little bit on the mental health first aiders. I think it's, it, it's I'm so pro that I am one myself. And um, I think it's a, a brilliant thing that that the, the focus on maintaining that engagement and, and visibility. And I think that it's not, um, I note there that there was low attendance to the trial drop-ins. And I think that that is actually a really good thing. Um, and that it, 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 it can feel a bit like, oh, what do we do? But actually I think that, that if something isn't working, I really applaud you for this is this is a different way of doing that. And so I just wanted to say that I think that it's a good thing that, that they weren't necessarily that used, but obviously the visibility is, is, is really high. So that's that's excellent. Love the fact that you've got the wellbeing app. I think that's really brilliant. Um, but also I thought that it, I thought this paper showed a really careful consideration to the what what you're placing online managers because by accepting a responsibility as an employer you're effectively handing that to a line manager and and, and that is a big responsibility that is not necessarily always always the right one and it is around signposting so i just thought the tone of this was excellent and and the tone therefore of the work that you're doing is is, is spot on so um well done and thanks for bringing it here because i think it's a good place to just make sure that we've got a bit of just a check and balance on that as well and and uh, and yeah big tick um, I can't see any other hands up, uh, so I'm going to I'm going to just presume that that means that we're all happy to note that report um, and move into item eight, which is about future discussion topics, and a weird one this one because I think this is the last time that we'll meet in this format, and next time it will be a whole load of different people, and it definitely won't be me. Um, so I feel a bit weird uh, sort of sharing this this bit because I'm telling other people what to do in the future, um, which despite what my kids say, is not what I like doing. So I think all we should do now is just as a committee think, is there anything really urgent that we want to recommend to the next committee that they definitely have a look at or have a think about? And if there isn't, I suggest we let them shape their own future. I'm looking for any hands up, any interaction at all. <laughs> agree with all you say there. Yay! Um, I've I've just had a little look through the last um, minutes, just because uh, I know that we sometimes get suggested topics and things to think about. There's nothing on there that's really jumping out at me. We we have, as a committee said, we should keep an eye on that recovery plan. What does it mean for people? We can't necessarily put that into a list of these are the topics we discuss when because we because that's been evolving and, it, and it's a moving feast so I would suggest that as, as being sort of the first topic that the committee comes together to have a look at but other than that I don't think there is anything that's that's really urgent and we have collectively done a wonderful job at uh, uh, haven't we <laughs> and thank you Kate for chairing Oh, it's always my pleasure. This is my favourite part of the uh, of the uh, three, of the round of meetings. <laughs> um, okay, so with that, then I'm going to close the meeting. Um, unless anyone has anything else, no other hands.
Brilliant. All right. Everyone have a wonderful day. I still haven't figured out what day it is, but everyone have a wonderful 9th of March. And I'll see you, I'm sure, in the next few weeks in various meetings and things. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, uh, those that have prepared for this meeting so well. Thanks a lot.